So you told us how many countries are on board with the SKA, but um, how hard is it to get them all to agree on anything? It's not actually that hard at all, as it turns out. So I spent last night at a, an international SKA founding board meeting where we were discussing progressing of the SKA project, and I have to say it was an excellent meeting and a huge amount of progress was made in this eight hours, despite the fact that there were you know, the nine current member countries of the founding board plus a number of observing countries around the table. So actually it's not that hard. Obviously we don't necessarily agree on everything, but um, we work through a process where agreement does seem to follow. So, you know, we've agreed, broadly speaking, on the process by which a site will be selected from the two candidate sites. We've agreed um, on the process to um, implement the transition phase from where we are now in the project to the next four years, which is called the pre-construction phase. And we're working through um, how we're going to engage industry and research in that pre-construction phase. So, Although these are very complicated issues and you're dealing with many different governments and there are many different restrictions on the process, I think that the founding board has actually been astoundingly successful since its inception in April in moving the project forward. So it's not as hard as you think. The SKA in its entirety will, as I understand it, be actually made up of a few different types of radio telescopes. Could you tell us a bit about what the different types are and what they are actually trying to look for? Yep. So um, one of the things that we decided very early on was that we wanted to do this transformational science over a large part of the electromagnetic spectrum from megahertz all the way up to tens of gigahertz. And you can't do that with a single type of radio telescope. You need to have um, different antenna types to be able to cover that frequency range. So the SKA in its full incarnation is currently conceived of three different types of antennas. Whether or not we end up with three um, is a matter for the funding agencies. But um, there'll be the standard dish type antennas, which most people are used to, and these will probe the um, centimetre and potentially all the way up to slightly in the millimetre range of the frequency band. And then there's things like dipole arrays and dense aperture arrays, which are probably things that people are not quite as familiar with, but these are the low frequency components and they do different science. So for example, the experiment to detect the epoch of reionization, that's a low frequency experiment. So we're going to be looking down in the sort of um, regions of hundreds of megahertz and possibly even slightly lower than that, we'll see. The other experiments that you want to do where you're mapping the structure of nearby galaxies by looking for this thing called uh, the uh, spin flip transition of neutral hydrogen, which is this emission at 14, 20 megahertz, which gets redshifted. Well, it depends on where it gets redshifted as to what instrument you want to use for that, but probably mostly nearby we'll be using the dish arrays. Um, if you're trying to make incredibly cool images of things like Centaurus A, you might be using a dish array or you might be using um, one of the uh, low frequency arrays, just depending on what it is that you're trying to do. So they'll just do different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum and the different science associated with that. If we let our imagination to run wild for a moment, what sort of bizarre things do you think that the SKA might find? Yeah, well, that's a really interesting question. You know, the obvious answer that people would love to hear would be aliens. Um, I'm not quite sure that the SKA is going to find us aliens. I think one of the more interesting things that the SKA will do is open up different parts of parameter space where we don't have any information whatsoever. And one of the areas is... Um, for objects which are called transient objects. So these are things which emit only at short time intervals in the radio. And we have almost no knowledge of these things at the moment. Current radio telescopes are not set up to be able to study transient phenomena. And by definition, transient phenomena is going to be from pretty exciting things. It's going to be from black holes and pulsars and all sorts of objects which are weird in and of themselves. So I think if I were to predict where the bizarre is going to appear... Out of the SKA, it'll be in the regime of looking for transient objects. Awesome. So we've asked you lots and lots about um, the SKA and all sorts of the, the technical details, but why are you an astronomer? What oh confluence of circumstances led you to this <laughs> path? Stars. That, <laughs> yes, led you to the stars and a lack of sleep. Yeah, okay. Definitely a lack of sleep. Um, well, I always wanted to be an astronomer, so it's a bit of a sort of cliched story, but my grandmother used to take me outside and show me the night sky. So my grandmother uh, lived in, in Townsville in Australia, and it was, you know, back when I was young, it was quite dark, and we'd go and sit on the back step, and she'd show me the stars, and, and that was kind of cool, and I was inspired by that. And you might say that I was um, 
rather stubborn in my view, and so I kind of suffered through high school and through university to get to do astronomy. I never changed my mind. I thought that was what I was going to do. And I always thought that I wanted to be an optical astronomer because, you know, I wanted to make pretty pictures. And, and I have to say, almost all of my graduate students in radio astronomy have said the same thing. They said I wanted to be an optical astronomer because I wanted to make pretty pictures. And I went and I, I got a, a research fellowship at the Anglo-Australian Observatory in Coonabarabra in New South Wales uh, when I was just after honours before I started my PhD. And I was so excited. I was like, oh, I've got to do optical astronomy. And uh, I really didn't like it very much, to be fair. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't have a good time. So at the end of that project, I was offered two PhD projects with very eminent scientists. One was an extremely eminent optical uh, astronomer, and the other one was an extremely eminent radio astronomer. And I knew nothing about radio, but I just spent three months working on this optical astronomy stuff, which I really didn't like. So I thought, well, what the hell, I'll just do radio astronomy. And that's how I became a radio astronomer. Um, I have to say, I've since gone back and done optical astronomy, and it's all fine, it's all good, there's nothing wrong with optical astronomy, it's great. Um, but yes, I became a, a radio astronomer by, by accident, but I have no regrets, I have a great time being a radio astronomer. And I have to say, I think that all of the students that I've supervised have said the same thing, so if they've, they've eventually come around to making radio astronomy their uh, passion. Where do you kind of see the future of astronomy going because we've got the the square kilometer array which is obviously a really big instrument for for radio astronomers and then we've got other things like james webb space telescope for looking towards infrared and we've got ground-based telescopes and space-based telescopes are, are we all going to eventually build some giant multifunctional telescope on the other side of the moon or will we keep doing slightly different projects in slightly different places by slightly different groups well, I think that physics dictates that we'd struggle to build a huge telescope on the dark side of the moon, which could do all those things. So I suspect we're going to continue to be stuck in different wavelength bands just by physics. However, I think that astronomy itself is changing sociologically. So, you know, whereas before you might have a telescope in your home country or your home institution even, and that would have been sufficient to do cutting-edge research, and you'd have an isolated team of people, maybe you'd collaborate with a few other people, but not so much. We aren't in that regime anymore. We need to be moving towards really multinational, large-scale projects to push us to the edge of knowledge. And if you do that, then the way you do science as a scientist changes enormously. So you end up in large teams. These teams are distributed across the world. Um, you need to develop different tools to be able to manage those teams and to be able to communicate with those teams. It leads to a huge amount of a lack of sleep for me. But yeah, no, it's, it's changing sociologically. And it's really the science that's driving that change. But we're fortunate that we have things like the internet which allow it to happen. So I think that astronomy is a discipline. You'll see more people doing science with things like the Virtual Observatory. You'll see more the rise of citizen science, like the Galaxy Zoo Project, where people go in and make discoveries you know, lay people go in and make discoveries using uh, tools which astronomers put online for them. I think there'll be a, a huge amount of that increasing as we go forward in the years. This sounds beautiful, and um, it's an amazing uh, picture that um, you're presenting for, uh, for the skies. How is tomorrow going to look like? I actually think tomorrow won't look very different to today. I think that if you look at the rate of... Um, innovation and progress. If you look at our generation versus the generation of, say, my grandparents, we really haven't had that much change. Now, if I look back at my childhood, well, you know, we had shopping malls and we had cars and, you know, we had plastics and TVs and all of these things. So there's been the internet, which has been a huge revelation. But other than that, things don't seem that different to me. If I were to go back and I would talk to my grandfather, who was born in 1907, you know, these are people who saw air travel appear and become increasingly popular. You know, they saw transistors, they saw plastics at the end of his life, the internet. So I think for us, tomorrow is not going to be that different to today. Maybe 10 years time is going to be perceivably different from today. But if I look back 20 years, it doesn't seem that different. So I'm not sure it's going to perceive, we're not going to perceive it to be that different. Now, hopefully we've got things like better medical treatments and... Um, Perhaps these new technologies like nanotechnologies will start to take off or, you know, genetic engineering. But so far, we haven't quite got there. So for the next few years, at least, I think we're going to see incremental rather than major progress.
Are we going to be a spacefaring civilization or are we going to look at the stars from here, from Earth? I think that given the financial situation of the world at the moment, spacefaring is probably a bit of a ways off. So I think you need to recover economically. I mean, we're in a situation where large-scale projects are nearly being axed or certainly projects are having difficulties getting funding from various governments. So given the expense of space, I think we're going to have to wait a little while. But, you know, I'm sure humans will get there eventually. It's just that for now we've got to sort out that pesky economy thing. And when we will, we will uh, know exactly what to expect because you've already discovered it with the uh, radio telescopes. Uh, well, you know, space is stranger than, than we can imagine, so I'm sure that's not true. Once we go, we're sure to find things that we didn't expect. Yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> Even if we don't. Discovery potential is everywhere. you just got to get out there and do it. I think people should do what they want to do. I think that people should not be afraid to do pure basic research. I think that um, there's a lot of questions which come back to astronomers saying, you know, well, why do astronomy? What's the point of that? Um, I think what I would like to remind people is that huge amounts of the incremental advances that we have in our technological society come from people being passionate and driven to do something off the wall, like maybe understand how black hole works. So, you know, you shouldn't be frightened to pursue those things. Don't be driven to become lawyers and economists and so forth because other people tell you you should. If you really want to study the stars or space or engineering, go and do that. Thank you so much. That's all right. It's going to. And now just to finish up, we've got to say thanks to all the people who have contributed to make this podcast possible. First off, a huge thanks to the New Zealand Science Media Centre for allowing us use of their recording equipment. Thanks to the amazing composer Rian Sheehan. For the intro and outro music. Thanks to the Kiwi Space Foundation. And thank you World Space Week Association. 